We're back. Time for an absolutely unexpected emergency edition of the Carolina Insider. Guys, never before have we needed to play so many different things at the beginning of a show. But let's start with, of course, reminding you that it's a pot after dark. But Adam, full respect to the pot after dark music, we have to fade it down immediately. Because there's only one way that we can properly enter this podcast tonight. <laughs> Holy cow. I, I, you, if you're watching, we're, we're video potting this as well. So you're seeing Adam dancing. Adam, I've never been more both excited and scared that you might get in a fight or kicked out of an arena as happened tonight as the Tar Heels beat Duke 94-81. From like 4.30 till 9.30. Yeah. I mean, it would nonstop. Yeah. That was and glorious. By James. the way, am I hydrated? Yeah, we're hydrated up. We're ready. Yeah, let's do this. You were to say it was glorious. It was glorious. It was glorious. Adam, I said this on the post game, and I think it's right. It's one of the more impactful regular season wins for Carolina ever. And outside, I mean, nothing tops a national championship. We all understand that. For a regular season game, I, I'm just not sure it gets a whole lot better than that. And we talked about this a little bit during the week. Carolina set the tone for this starting Monday night. This wasn't just a Saturday thing that happened. This started Monday night after the win over Syracuse. Moments after the win over Syracuse, Hubert Davis was already talking about Carolina's not going over there for a party, not going over there to be part of the festivities, and they weren't. They came out to play. They did not give in even when Duke got a, a pretty sizable first-half lead and closed it up before halftime, and that set the stage for an incredible second half. Let's just talk about the game itself first, and we'll talk about all the other stuff. Um, four Tar Heels finish in double figures. Four Tar Heels finish with more than 20 points. First time in Carolina history that four players have finished with 20 or more points in the same game. Baycott with 23, also had seven rebounds, two blocks, two steals. Love had 22, including 12 of 12 at the free throw line with, if I'm not mistaken, six of six in the final 90 seconds or so. R.J. Davis, I, don't know, I thought it was his best game as a Tar Heel. 21 points, nine of 16 from the floor, two of four from three, hit a huge three in the final couple minutes, had four assists, two turnovers. And Brady Manick, a double-double, 20 points, 11 rebounds. He was 7 of 16, 5 of 10 from three, and had a couple of huge threes, one late in the first half and then uh, two late in the second half. Um, and that's not to exclude Leaky Black because he had six points, five rebounds, three assists, and was awesome on defense um, as he normally is. Those five did not leave the game in the second half. Manick and Davis did not leave the game, period. What a performance by everybody, but those five, I mean, what a what a performance by them. I don't know if even Jody Zogner knows this one. When's the last time Carolina didn't sub in the entire second half? Zero substitutions, none. Yeah. And you had Leaky Black cramping up a little bit, and Doug Halverson was looking at Armando Baycott's foot, and he was hobbled some, and Caleb Love was trying to run off a twisted ankle, and they just kept playing and kept making plays, and they just out tough Duke all over Coach K court. A couple of stretches that I thought were really important. You referenced the one. Duke went on the 14 nothing run in the final minutes of the first half. Carolina had led for a majority of the first half, and then Duke went on this 14 nothing run, led by as many as nine, and you thought, uh-oh, yeah, here it comes. But the Tar Heels were able to stay connected enough and then had two late threes, one by Manic and one by Davis, right at the end of the first half to be down only two. And Adam, that felt like a huge win for Carolina to be down only two after Duke had hit them with that absolute flurry of, of basketball for a couple of minutes where Carolina was struggling. Baycott was on the bench in foul trouble. The Tar Heels were struggling to get quality looks. Duke was getting easy buckets, and it just felt like things were about to go the wrong way. 
Caleb Love hit a big 3-2 with under two minutes to play in that half. Yeah, he did. Yeah. And I think you got to give credit to Hubert Davis, too, because the big run had happened with Armando Baycott out. And I'm guessing the original plan was, let's sit Armando Baycott down for the rest of the half. And once it got to 35-28, Hubert Davis brought him back in with under four minutes to go in the first half. And that was big because it stopped the Duke run. Yeah, Duke could have closed out Carolina right there. I mean, that could have been a 12 or 14 point halftime lead that would have been tough to come back from. But Baycott comes back in. He scores a minute or so after that. And then the three point floodgates open and Carolina gets it back to two. And then, Adam, I'm going to try my best to explain this. I don't know when it started. I'm going to guess five or six minutes left to go in the game. And it was a back and forth game. And then all of a sudden, the Tar Heels started getting stops and scores and stops and scores. And shoot, you were there even though you got kicked out of your original seat. <laughs> you, you were there. It was almost as if no one could believe it was happening. The Duke players, the fans. It was like, wait, 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 wait. This isn't in the Coach K last game script. This isn't what's supposed to be happening. Bancaro kept forcing up bad shots. Duke missed some threes. R.J. Davis hit a big three. Manic had a layup in there after a good drive. It was either Love or, or Davis who drove and got him the ball. Uh, Baycott had a big dunk in there when Duke was trying to get a little pressure to try to get a turnover. And, and all of a sudden, there was like 30 seconds left, and the Tar Heels were up 12, and it, it had all happened almost in this fog in Cameron because no one could believe that it was happening. But it did. It was 70-69 with six minutes left after Keels ran for a first down and was fouled <laughs> and made two free throws. And then R.J. Davis hit a three. Leaky Black, his first basket of the game, oh, that up is and this under. ridiculous up and under that layup. That was a sweet play. Who makes that shot as their first basket of the game? And from then on, it felt like every time Carolina – came down court with the ball you just felt like the Tar Heels have got a score right here and somehow they did and I thought Armando Baycott's block on Griffin was mm -hmm. a big one with under about two minutes to go it was a six-point game at that oh, point oh yeah Carolina turned it over yeah it, Carolina had turned it over and it looked like Griffin had an easy basket and then here comes Baycott did he foul him I don't know I nah. couldn't really see from where I was but I know they didn't blow the whistle nah. so it wasn't a foul and it it felt like that just sap them of any want to and even after when when keels was taking those free throws everybody on the duke sideline was very tense and you looked over at hubert davis and he was like sitting on the scores table just kind of looking around and taking everything in and it it wasn't dean smith but it was very dean smith like to have everyone freaking out and you've got that one calm person just standing there We'll talk about Hubert Davis in, in a minute. Um, I don't know if Armando Baycott's going to win ACC Player of the Year. I'm going to vote for him. 23 points on 10 of 11 shooting and 7 rebounds, helping to lead Carolina to what is the single best road victory in the country this season, period, the end. Um, his shots were of high degree of difficulty. It was an enormous difference when he wasn't in the game. Carolina's ability to uh, effectively compete – he was terrific. I, and again, this is nothing against Leaky Black or Manic or Caleb Love, who all had huge moments. Manic's three from the left sideline late was maybe the, the knockout blow. I thought Davis and Baycott were the ones who led Carolina to this win. And Hubert Davis talked about it with us afterwards. Carolina found that high screen and just kept going to it. And, and Duke was struggling to stop it with either Mark Williams or Theo John guarding Baycott. They were struggling to stop it, and Carolina just kept going to it. Davis would either get a switch, get the big guy on him, take him to the rim, or they'd try to you know switch it back and or you know, get back on their original guy, and they'd find Baycott for a good look. Carolina just found something and would not let go of it. Theo John could be a poor man's Grayson Allen if he had four years there. Well, he definitely. I mean, he got the flagrant foul where he just almost like belly to back suplexed. Caleb Love to the ground in the first half. And then I'll fully honest, I don't know what happened between he and Baycott, but Armando Baycott was certainly, he seemed to think that something extracurricular had happened. I mean, the fact that he was in there pounding the floor 
and the referees never went and looked at it had he gotten another flagrant. If I'm not mistaken, he was out of the game, and but the referees never looked at it. The thing about Baycott's performance is it was against Mark Williams. Mark Williams is good. It, it, Mark Williams is good. He's a good defensive player. He may win defensive player of the year. Who knows? Some of those shots Baycott made were ridiculous. Yeah, They were like the – the interior guy's version of the no, 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 good shot, three. But it was like a no, 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 good shot, hook shot. And somehow he just kept putting them in the basket. Carolina's ability not to stop Duke from getting to the basket, but to more effectively stop them from getting all the way to the rim, I thought was a big deal in the second half. Um, Duke shot 58% in the first half, 42% in the second half. That's a pretty significant difference. Um they got to the rim so much in the first half. And Carolina at least challenged those shots better in the second half and forced a lot more of 8 to 12-foot jump shots, especially by Bancaro, who finished with 23 points, but he took 26 shots to get his 23 points. That defense was a difference maker. And a solid 17 or 18 of Bancaro's shots were the shots Carolina wanted, wanted him yes. to take. Yes. And – he was willing to settle for those 18 of Duke's 31 shots in the first half were either layups or dunks. And I think points in the paint in the first half was 30 to 12, 30 for Duke. And you know, that's what Hubert Davis talked about at halftime, uh, keeping them out of the paint with the dribble and Carolina did a much better job. And once Carolina showed some resistance, Duke was willing to shoot some jumpers. Yep. And on another day, maybe those jumpers go in, but it doesn't matter what happens on the other day. It only what matters what happens on two day, and two day they just didn't make enough of them. Yeah, I mean Duke didn't shoot poorly from three, thirty seven percent, seven of nineteen. I mean it's not great, but it's not you know two of fifty or something or two of twenty five. Um, yes, and, and it wasn't all just three point shots. To your point, I think I said it too. I mean just force them into shooting jumpers compared to getting to the rim. Um, Two other things, Adam, and then then we can kind of talk about all the other stuff. Tario shot nearly 60% in the second half. They shot 59.4% after taking 16 threes in the first half. And at one point, I think Carolina was 2 of 13 from 3 and then hit their last 3 in the first half. Then they only took 7 in the second half and made 4 of them, and it just felt like the threes were better threes um, in the second half where it came off penetration and kicking it out or, you know, the the shots you want where where they're good, clean looks. You you want those type of threes. And then the other thing is the free throw line. And this will be inflated a little bit because of the end of the game, but still the Tar Heels were plus 13 at the free throw line in this five game winning streak to close the regular season. I think it's their plus 46 at the free throw line against their opponents. It's a really good free throw shooting team. I particularly love and Davis and leaky black, although Baycott's been solid there, too. Um, But plus 13 at the line was huge. And I was so worried that the uh, Carolina left a few points hanging at the free throw line early middle part of the second half. Very concerned that that was going to turn out to come back and bite them, but it didn't because they ended up getting on a streak where they made them all. And you talked about the better offense in the second half. Love how they came out and just pounded it inside to Baycott. Three of the first five shots – in the second half were from Armando Baycott and that's where Carolina's advantage was and they came out after the break and just fed him over and over and over. Adam Hubert Davis you and I were both in the locker room area after the game he was as it was like this you can it was like every human emotion there there was like happiness he was crying he was like angry at no one in particular just yelling things (laughs) What a win for him individually, and he'd never say that, but what a win for him individually. Yeah, I mean, you learn a lot about somebody in that setting. I mean, like, he held it together a lot better than I did. And to to have, in the immediate moments after that game, people are just freaking out, and he's just standing there hugging Armando Baycott, telling him how proud he is of him. And then here comes Brady Manick, and Brady Manick's crying. I mean, it was like a Friday afternoon <laughs> soap opera. And I'm over here, and I'm crying. I don't even know why. And then here comes R.J. Davis, and he's all fired up. And then Hubert's fired up. But to go from crying to jubilant like that, and then he's going in the <laughs> locker room, and people are throwing water around. I mean, you, there's no amount of money that could – you take your NIL wherever you want to. 
they'll never forget that 30 minutes and stretch it out to an hour, stopping on Franklin Street on the bus on the way back. Oh, look You'll, at you with the scoop, Adam. They'll never, they'll never forget that, ever. And we'll never forget that. I mean, anytime we see any of those five guys, especially those five guys who didn't come out in the second half, that's the first thing I'm going to think of. Jeff Lebo walked out of the locker room just right next to where you and I were, and he just said, they'll, they'll remember this one for the rest of their lives. Oh, old wise words from Jeff Lebo. <laughs> you rascal. Um, Adam, just let me, one more thing about Hubert Davis. To your point, I, not just was it like a special night, like he coached a really good game. Like, I mean, there's the, like, he helped his team win the game by what he did on the sideline. He made some smart substitutions, I thought, in the first half as best he could with the per- that kind of how things were going, especially, I mean, even being willing to take out Baycott for that last, like, two minutes of the first half after you'd put him back in to try and stop the bleeding. Even put in put in done, I think, for the last minute because Leaky Black had two fouls. So I mean, just some smart substitutions. We talked about the offense finding that weakness and attacking it. You are right that he in a in a building that was anything but calm tonight, he seemed to be the less the least impressed person with everything going on. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I mean it in that none of that was gonna bother him or take him off track for what he felt like he was trying to do. Everything he said and talked about this week, both in public and not in public, is what happened. I mean, what he told his team was going to happen on Saturday was right. And the things he told his team were going to be important. Like, they worked really hard one day in practice on keeping Bancaro from getting an easy pass at kind of the elbow and then doing whatever he wanted to do. And he said, you have to fight. If you let him catch the ball, he's going to score. But if you fight, they'll turn it over. It happened in like the first minute two of the game. They tried to throw that, and Brady Manick went in there and stole it. I mean, it didn't end up being a one-possession game, but it felt like it might be. The stuff he told his team was going to be important is what ended up being important. And you mentioned kind of taking Baycott in and out. I thought taking Baycott out in the first three minutes was important. When he picked, he picked up, up an that early first foul, foul yeah. sat him down, and put in Puff Johnson. And was Puff Johnson great? No, but he ate up three fouls that you couldn't afford for any of them to be on Baycott. Yeah. And to take him out for five minutes right there and let him just chill out for just a minute, I thought showed that he learned something from the game here when Baycott got hit twice quickly. And he wasn't going to let that happen again. He was going to manage the game his way, and whether that won or lost the game, he was okay with that, and it won the game. Tario's only turned it over five times. And only once in the second half. That's pretty good. I think it's because Duke didn't slap the floor. Well, Adam, that's a nice transition. To It was an absolute circus around this game. Um, from all the coverage throughout the day to the former Duke players, almost 100 of them forming a tunnel for Coach K to walk through before the game started and then meet at center court. It was almost like Duke was trying to jam in the what the Tar Heels did for like the hundred years celebration, but the critical mistake that they had is they did it on a game day and then they lost. And so, man, there was just so much stuff going on around this game. And I don't know if Duke would ever admit this, and maybe I'm wrong. I think it made them tight. I absolutely think it made them tight. I don't. And I don't even know necessarily the team, like the, around the team, like the support people, the coach, like they, everybody just seemed on edge. And maybe they weren't. Maybe that's me totally misreading the room. But man, it felt like everybody was on edge because they wanted it to go right so badly. And then it didn't. Well, how could you not be tight? Right. Like, think about how we felt on, for example, Tyler Hansbrough's senior day. That was four years. You really wanted it to go well for him. Shoot, I was tight during the state game this year just because Coach Williams was getting honored at halftime. Right, <laughs> yeah. and But this this was 42 years of wanting it to go right, and it has to go exactly this way. It It's the most important thing that's happened since the moon landing, and it has to go exactly right. And as soon as there was just a little flicker of, well, guys – the Washington generals aren't here. The Tariels showed up. It was like, and I, I think 
if it had been some of those guys wearing the white alumni shirts or whatever, once Coach K took off the quarter zip, they would have known, like, oh, snap, K <laughs> took off the quarter zip. We're about to get serious. But these guys, like, they don't know. They don't know. They, they don't have that experience or that frame of reference or those four years with Mike Krzyzewski. To know that, like, when the quarter zip comes off the or K, the jacket the, the off. The K-branded quarter zip. Yeah. Like, it's it's Now he's just wearing a K-branded uh, polo shirt. It's not about him. It's about not him. And it just, it didn't feel like. like if look, that, at the, look on the official box score. It says K there on the top. Oh, my gosh. I'm gonna hang on to that See, one. See, I didn't get an official box right, score, right, right, so right, I wouldn't know. Right, but, right, I mean. How can you even say with a straight face that it's not about him when you do that? So for the Tar Heels, Adam, it reminded me a little bit of 06 in that you go in there with nobody thinking you're going to win on a night that's been all about Duke and you win. We've talked about before, which, by the way, I'm sure we'll do a rewatch of this game and our, our kids will in 40 years when they're hosting the pod. And we'll do one in a week. Yeah, we'll probably just do one in the offseason. No big deal. Uh We've talked about the 06 team before. That they, that was they emptied the tank in that game. The Tar Heels very well could have emptied the tank tonight. Uh, I think the job now is enjoy it. You don't play again until Thursday at nine thirty. Don't know who you're playing. Carolina is the three seed. Um, I'll grab the bracket here in a second, but enjoy it for a day. Get ready to. Go back to work on, I guess, probably Monday for the team. Um, then they leave for Tuesday. They leave on Tuesday for Brooklyn. Um, that will not be easy to do, but that's the job now. And it's tough. I mean, you've heard on here before some of the 06 guys talk about how once you rev it to that red line peak of adrenaline and emotion into one game, to bring that back, you are not going to reach that level no. on Thursday night in Brooklyn. No. You're just not going to. I, I don't want to offend anyone who, oh, the Tar Heels should play hard every time they put on that uniform. Of course. You won't reach that peak on Thursday night no matter who you're playing. And that's okay. And Duke is still good. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's not like – And don't worry. You know Mike Chess is going to use this to – probably march right to the championship game of the ACC tournament. There's no doubt about that. They'll beat whoever they play Thursday by 100. Yeah. But they didn't do that on Saturday night. I know that for sure. And it's going to be a challenge to get Carolina back together, but I, there's not many more things that could be more memorable coming out of this season than winning that game and knowing that forever, ever, 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 Mike Krzyzewski's on a one-game losing streak on Coach K Court. So, Brooklyn, nine thirty Thursday night. Carolina is the three seed. They will play either Virginia, who is the six, or Louisville or Georgia Tech. So, Louisville and Georgia Tech play one another on Tuesday night. Louisville, the 11 seed. Georgia Tech, the 14. Those two teams play at 7 o'clock on Tuesday. The winner of that game plays Virginia on Wednesday. And then the winner of the Virginia v. either Louisville or Georgia Tech plays Carolina on Thursday night. So either Virginia, Louisville, or Georgia Tech. Carolina played Louisville and Georgia Tech twice this year, played Virginia just once um, a long time ago. Virginia's playing better now than they were then. Um, and we're still going to have, by the way, our full podcast on Tuesday. We just felt we had to, had to, had to get in here and do this. Adam, I have two more things for you. First, uh, what else? Like what other things did your keen eye see and – feel and I know you haven't even pinned your column yet there's still tears to be shed across the state and nation and world I don't think I'll ever forget that sound that came from the Cameron crazies every time Brady Manick shot a three in the second I half. was like oh no no <laughs> and kaboom and then he'd throw up the big three well, and he was open a lot he was how was he open he was open a lot. That has to be on the top line of the scouting report, right? Like One would think. This is the guy you can't let shoot an open three. Um, so I, I don't think I'll ever forget that sound. Side note, Manic, real fast, in the two games against Duke, even the loss in Chapel Hill in the two games, he was 11 of 20 from three-point range. It's pretty good. He had more than 20 points in both games. And that's a guy who doesn't know all that much about Carolina Duke, but he does now. I tell you what, 
we've said this before. I know Brady Mannix only been here for one year. Brady Mannix is going to be a Tar Heel though forever. And I'm sure the Sooners think he's a Sooner forever too. But there's just something about Brady. He just he just fits with the Tar Heels for whatever reason. I don't know why, but he does the way he plays. And he was as happy as anybody after that one. And his dad was overjoyed. His dad picked me up in a big old bear hug <laughs> out on the Cameron Indoor uh. Stadium concourse. Uh, Kerry Manick and was like, it's not so loud in here like you told me it was going to be. Ah! <laughs> it was wonderful. Um, so, I, I mean, I just, I, I don't, and I don't think I'll ever forget, it was like a meet the team back at the Smith Center game yeah. where people just randomly showed up in the parking lot. Franklin Street Bananas got some shots from there. Te- full, full, like, won a championship celebration. Bus went by Franklin Street, and I think Hubert Davis got off the bus and kind of waved to people. Uh. I mean, what more could you want? I don't know. That was my final point. And I've already seen it where on Twitter people are like, oh, well, if you think this is a, if this is what Carolina thinks is matters now, then I, how far it's fallen that they're only word. Shut up. <laughs> the, this, and it, anybody who acts like they don't know why is just sour grapes. This is perhaps the most memorable regular season win. And again, we said this, we're not trying to equate this to a championship. Nothing beats it. That's what you play for. The stakes can only get so high in the regular season. I can't imagine they get any higher than ton- than tonight in the regular season. And the Tarles responded with their best game of the year and did something that has not been done in, however, you know, what is it, 113 years or whatever it is at Carolina basketball where four guys scored 20 or more points. Every player that played did something to help them win. Those five starters, though, going down forever for, for their performance. It's the all-time one-up. Yes. I mean, we always talk about how the part of the reason Carolina Duke is so big is because people love going back and forth with their buddies at work. What happened tonight is the that's an all-timer. N- nothing will ever be able to take that away, ever. Your buddy says, oh, Mike Krzyzewski did this, Mike Krzyzewski did that. From now until eternity, you're going to say, how do you do in that last game at Cameron Indoor Stadium? What happened in that game? Big time. What a big time game. Adam really did almost get kicked out. <laughs> that, we didn't make that part up. But I was inside for the whole thing, and it was glorious. Okay. Uh, Adam, we have a decision to make. Who should get us out of here on the big grits? We've got Hubert Davis. Uh, do we have all five starters? Yeah, we have all five starters for the Tar Heels. Should we just do Hubert Davis and all five starters? Yes. There'll never be a bigger honor than this. <laughs> I know you boys think you're about to have a good night on Franklin Street. Getting to do the big grits as a unit, as yeah. you deserve, the Iron Five. Yeah. It gets no bigger. I really want to play Cascada again. Should we just play it one more time? Yes. Adam, I have to say, when Cascada started playing, I almost lost it on the air. I kept it together, though. I kept it together. Cascada. I think now you could retire that. If you're Duke? Yeah. Oh, I think John Shire's got to. I think he has to. I think he has to say, look, guys, new new regime. I want to walk in my shoes in the path that co- <laughs> that Coach K set. But we're going to do things a little differently, and that includes getting rid of Cascada. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Tears for Fears. (laughs) (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, time for a little take my breath away. (laughs) Adam, tears in Cameron tonight? Check. Yeah. Before and after. All right, so let's let all five of the starters and Hubert Davis get us out of here and the RZA get us out of here on the special emergency. And we're back, by the way, normal pod on Tuesday um, with Brian Kersey, and we'll preview ACC term and all that. And probably talk some more about this Duke game. But for now, the Tar Heels and the RZA get us out of here on the latest edition of the Carolina Insider. There's Kersh right out there. He was celebrating. Apparently. <laughs> 